for the chain Simons and interval field theories. Okay, thanks for the introduction. And let me then start by thanking the organizers for this very nice call and for giving me then the, the opportunity to present these lectures today. And so indeed, I will uh, talk today about Fordich and Simons and its relation to integrable field theories and in particular, integrable sigma models. And let me start by saying also that uh, the lecture notes, the written lecture notes, they're rather complete and a bit formal and so on. But here I will try to take a slightly less detailed point of view and a bit more informal. And also for reason of time, I won't be able to, to cover everything that was in the, in the written notes, but okay, I will invite you to, to see the written notes for more details if you. And so what I would like to start with is just some general introduction and an overview of, of these lectures. And I would like to then, and of course, uh, please interrupt me if you have any question and I'm also happy to have any feedback on Slack, so by, by email. And so then let me let me start then by some general discussion of some general motivations for these lectures. So will be interesting today, particularly in two-dimensional integrable field theories. And because I will use these name, these words a lot, let me say that I will call that IFT sometimes. And well, what we saw in, in Anna's lecture typically, and also in Ben, is that this is typically done by using the Lux, this is studied by using the Lux formalism in the study of Lux connections. To that I they said so yeah uh, Anna and Ben lecture and well here my the main observation that I would like to actually say is that in general if I'm given a certain field theory and I would like to say whether it's integrable or not so I would like to find whether it admits or not a lax connection this is actually a hard task because finding a lax connection is a is, is hard in general, because there's no systematic way of, of finding one if you don't know in advance some kind of structure in the field. And well, because of that, it's natural to try to find some systematic way of constructing such integrable field theory. So here we would change a bit the, the perspective instead of taking a random field theory and trying to answer whether it's integrable or not, we would kind of find a systematic way of constructing a lot of integrable field theories, which automatically would have a lax connection. And then we would try to see what is the panorama of models we get in this way. And also that would help us understand the kind of underlying structure behind all, the, all of these field theories. And this is exactly where the 4D chain Simons theory sits, because this 4D chain Simons then was is one of this uh, systematic construction that was recently proposed for, to construct an automatically integrable field. So that was proposed actually not so long ago. It was proposed by Costello and Yamazaki in a paper in 2019. So it's been basically now two years, and it's still a quite active. Uh, <clears throat> area of research at the time. And well, what I would like to do then today is mostly to review what's in this paper and a few things that have been done in, in a few papers that, that followed. And just for completeness, let me say that there are also other kind of systematic uh, ways of constructing field theories that have been developed in parallel, one of them being based on what are called affine Godard models. And these turns out to be actually deeply related to Fordich and Simon's theories, just a, kind of another phase of the same, of the same approach. But today I would actually focus only on these 40. I mean, and for these lectures, I will focus only on these 40 Chen Simons models in general. Okay, so with this motivation in mind, what I would like to do now in the rest of this introduction is to give an overview of why there should be a relation between 40 Chen Simons theory and integrable field fields. And from now on, I will start to now be slightly more technical and start using a bit more equations. And I will try to at least pinpoint some of the easy way we can see that there is a relation with field integrable field theories. And then some of other aspects will be more complicated and will not be enough for an introduction to, to discuss it. And that, well, the goal at the end of the lectures will be mostly to try to explain this in more details. But let me start then by recalling very briefly what I will mean here by an integrable field theory in 2D. Okay. 
So if I take a field theory on a, on a space-time sigma, so a 2D space-time, and on which I will typically use some coordinate t and x, so time t and space x, and with certain fields that let's call them phi i of tx, some number of fundamental fields of which I know the field equation. Then to get, a, uh, to get integrability, what we would typically construct, as we mentioned before, is a lax connection, which is the data of two matrices. So one called LT and the other one called LX. So that is what we saw in, in Anna's lecture typically. And these two matrices, they depend on the fields, phi i of the theory in a certain way. So they, in particular, they're then functions of t and x. And they also depend on an auxiliary parameter, which we call z, which is a complex parameter, which we call the spectral parameter. And so as it's complex, well, typically it would it could be valued in a complex plane, or actually what I will, I will generally see it as belonging to the Riemann sphere, which is just an, the complex plane to which we added the point at infinity to kind of complete it. And then these two, this dependence should be a meromorphic dependence in general. And well, the important equation that this Lax connection should, should obey is the Lax equation, which says that the equation of motion of my field theory should be equivalent to the zero curvature equation for my lax connection, which takes the following form. So plus commutator LT LX equals zero. And this well should be true for all values of the spectral parameters n. And well, what we saw in, in the lectures then of Havana is that if we have such an equation, then we can construct the uh, path ordered exponential of LX, so the, its monodromy matrix. And from there, we can extract conserved charges. And in particular, the fact that we have this equation for all values of the spectral parameter Z, we can then vary the Z, or we can typically expand in Z. For instance. And what we will find then is an infinite number of conserved quantity using this. And in particular, what we see here is that the spectral parameter Z is crucial for integrability because it's what is responsible in the end for having an infinite number of, of conserved quantities in the fear. Okay, so that was just a very brief reminder of what I mean by integrable field theory. For me, it will be always a 2D field theory with a lax connection, which has a spectral parameter. Okay, and so now what I would like to explain is how this can be related to Fordich and Simon's theory, but actually before talking about Fordich and Simon's theory, so I will start to re-explain what is Chen Simon's theory in general. Here yeah, I will not suppose any, any pre previous knowledge on, on, on Chen Simon's theory. And actually the standard Chen Simon's theory, before it was defined in 4D, it's actually defined standardly in 3D. So before talking about this four-dimensional version, I would like to just say a few words about the standard. 3D Chen Simon sphere. So this is a gauge theory on some space time M, which is then of dimension three. And I will use typically coordinates on it like X mu, where mu then goes from one to three. And well, as a gauge theory, it depends on a the gauge field. A mu, which is then a, a function of, of the coordinate x and which have three components, one to three, and which is valued in a, in a certain Lie algebra. Which I will denote by little g here. And well, for simplicity, I mean, here I will restrict to having a simple Lie algebra. And also I will take it to be a matrix Lie algebra in the sense that we took a representation 
to study it so that we can think of AMU as just some matrix, which could be, for instance, in, in SUN or in SON or your, your favorite Lie algebra. And in terms of this gauge field, we define the action of the Chan Simons theory in the following way. So we're going to integrate something over M, so over R3 coordinates, the X mu. And what we're going to integrate is the following. So I first take my gauge field A mu. I multiply it by its derivative D nu A rho. And I also take a term which is cubic in the fields, A mu A nu A rho. And so, okay, these are matrices. So this whole thing is a matrix. We have a product of matrix. So to get a number to integrate now, we'll actually take the trace of all this. And now, because this is a tensor, which have three indices mu nu rho, I need to contract it with another tensor to get a number. And I will, what I will do is I contract it with the levi civita tensor, so the purely skew-symmetric tensor in three dimension. And now I get an action, which is just a certain functional of my A. And in particular, I can look at the properties of this, uh, of this theory, at least for, for the moment at the classical level. And for instance, I can look at its equation of motion just by looking at the variation of this action. And well, that will actually go into more details on this later in the, in the lectures. But let me just say for the moment that the result is that a certain quantity, f mu nu, which is defined as d mu a nu minus d nu a mu, plus a mu a nu is equal to zero. And so here you recognize, uh, here you recognize the curvature of the gauge field as typically in, you would consider, you would have in young Mills theory, for instance, right? or in any non-abelian gauge theory you, that you would define then uh, by taking this particular uh, configuration of the, of the gauge field. And well, for instance, in the case of an abelian algebra, you would not have this commutative term here. So we'd have only this term. And then you would recognize here the, the strange field uh, of, the, of the Maxwell tensor, right, which, which contained the electric and, and magnetic field. And more generally, for an abelian, for a non-abelian the algebra, you would have this commutative term. And well, the important point point about uh, the Chan Simons theory is that it's exactly made so that this curvature is actually zero on shell. This is the equation of motion. Okay. Uh, please tell me at some if, I, if at any point you have a question. Then another important property of this theory is that, well, as I said, this is a gauge theory, so it should have some gauge symmetry, some local symmetry. And this local symmetry is attacked by function that I will call u, which are function on my manifold value in the group G, where this group G, we take it to be the, the group whose um, Lie algebra is my Lie algebra that I chose here. So typically connected and simply connected Lie group with this Lie algebra. And the way this gauge transformation acts on my gauge field is by the following expression. So I act by conjugation on, on A, and then I also have a derivative term. And here also, you should recognize the standard gauge transformation for non-abelian gauge theories like, like young males, like you've seen in your courses before. And this then defines a gauge symmetry, a local gauge symmetry of the field. OK. And now well, what we see from this is that the equation of motion of the theory, it starts to resemble a little bit the Lax equation. Because what we saw from the Lax equation is what we had these two matrices Lx and Nlt, and they would satisfy a zero curvature equation. And here, by definition, we found an action in three dimension whose equation of motion was finding a zero curvature equation. So one can wonder if there, is, if there is a link between the two. And well, there are still some differences, too, which is, for instance, that the Lax connection was just in 2D, right? It was, there was LT and LX. While here I have, I have in 3D, I have three components of my gauge field. So to first understand how one could maybe go back to two dimension, what we could do is we will specify our coordinate. We say that the first coordinate x1, I'll call it T, 
the second coordinate x2, I'll call it x. And these are the coordinates that I would like to keep in some sense. And then the last coordinate, x3, well, this one I want to get rid of, and let me call it here, psi. And what we'll do then is we're going to fix the gauge. So because I have a gauge symmetry in my theory, I can use it to, to transform my A, and I can go to a gauge where I, I will fix the third component, A psi, to be zero. And this is what is sometimes called the actual gauge. And once I'm there, I actually get some important consequences from the equation of motion. And one is, well, if I look at my equation of motion, uh, the zero curvature equation, when, when one of the component is xi, because xi is zero, I see that most of the term actually vanish. And I simply get that d xi of my remaining component at and ax is zero. So actually, now my remaining component, their function of the of t and x. So in some sense here, I managed to reduce to two dimensions by doing this gauge fixing. I have now only two components in t and x, and I, they depend only on the variables t and x. And then of course, the remaining part of the equation of motion simply tells me that these ax and at now, in terms of my two remaining coordinates t and x, they satisfy the standard zero curvature equation. And now this really resembles even more the lax formalism, but there is one problem, which is that if we remember the lax formalism, we wanted to have this lax equation for all values of z. We had this auxiliary spectral parameter z on which L depended, and we wanted to have this zero curvature equation for z. And that's basically the main thing that is missing in this picture, in this Friedrich and Simon, which is that the spectral parameter is missing. And that's basically here where the analogy between Friedrich and Simon and integral field theory stop. We get the zero curvature equation, but without z, without the spectral parameter. And that's exactly where the Friedrich and Simon's theory becomes interesting. And now I will just like to present briefly some things about this Gordich and Simon sphere. And well, the idea is that this will solve our problem by incorporating the spectral parameter Z as part of the space time. of now four-dimensional chance Simons. And in particular, so going from 3D to 4D will have the effect that now I will be able to include the space time, the, the spectral parameter. And so more precisely, how we will define the space time of our four-dimensional chance Simons theory is as follows. So we'll have part of it, which is basically sigma, and which have these coordinates, these two real coordinates T and X, which will be in the end, of, time and space coordinate of the corresponding two-dimensional integral field theory that we'll construct from there. And then we'll have another part, which is CP1, right, the Riemann sphere, which then I have a complex coordinate Z. And if I have a complex coordinate Z, I also have the corresponding uh, conjugate Z bar. And this, in the end, will play the role of the spectral parameter of the field. And in this theory, we still, similarly to the case of, of 3D, we still have a gauge field. And it has components AT, AX, and AZ bar. But actually, it will have no AZ component. So we kind of forget about the Z direction and focus on all the three others. And similarly, so here I will be very, it will be sketchy, so I will explain more in details uh, I mean, more precisely what it means later in the lecture, but very roughly the 4D Chen Simons action is defined by integrating over M. And what I integrate is I take the Lagrangian of the 3D Chen Simons action, but now along only three of the direction, which are Tx and Z bar. So I kind of take the 3D Chen Simons, but 
in the directions which are not Z, depending on my on these three components of the gauge field. And then in front of all this, I put something which is in the Z direction, which I called omega. And so this omega is just, it's a function of Z, phi Z, so a meromorphic function of Z times DZ. So I can see it as a one form on CB1. And more precisely, it will be a meromorphic one form on CP1. And well, importantly, this is part of the defining data of the theory. So although A is a field, it varies. Here, my this phi Z, it's not a field. It's just I, I take phi, I take phi Z or omega and I just specify it, some specified function, which for me defines the theory. So considering different omega will define different for each assignment. And well, now the consequence of this, uh, of going to this four dimensional Chen Simon theory is, well, I still have a similar equation of motion as usual. So once again, it's the zero curvature equation. But importantly here, it's the zero curvature equation where only along three of the direction, which are T, X, and Z bar. And that's, well, the effect of focusing only here in these three directions. So all this, as I said, we will rederive it in, in details. Here, it's a bit sketchy. And well, the effect of that is in particular, if I, I can take a gauge transformation, so I take my gauge field A, and I do a gauge transformation, and I will do a gauge transformation to a, no, to a new gauge, which for reason to become clear very soon, I will call L, the, the gauge field in this new gauge, I will call L, such that in this new gauge, there's no Z bar component. So L Z bar is zero. And that is basically the equivalent of what I did here by fixing XI to zero. Now I do it, but along the Z bar direction. And well, what I get from there is, of course, I get that on the two remaining components, LX and LT, I have the standard zero curvature equation now in 2D. But also, if I look at this equation where one of the components is Z bar, I get that DZ bar of LTX is equal to zero. And that is, well, the equivalent of what I had before when I said that d xi of ATX was zero. But now the difference is that I'm Z bar is just a complex conjugate of Z because I embedded all this into kind of a C, an additional CP1. And that the consequence of that is actually that if I have something killed by DZ bar, it means that this something, my LTX here, is holomorphic or actually, in fact, meromorphic in Z. And now what we see is that this becomes exactly the right property to be a lax connection, because we have something that depends meromorphically on an auxiliary complex parameter Z, which is then the spectral parameter. And we have then a lax equation, the zero curvature equation, which is true then for all the values of Z by construction. Okay, so that was kind of the easy way, I mean, the, the easy part in some sense of how integrable field theories are related to 4 H and Simons. So maybe actually here it's the right time to ask if there are questions. Maybe I have a question. Can you hear yes. me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, so in the axial gauge, is there a residual gauge symmetry acting and do we have to worry about that or? Oh, is this fine? So, okay, it depends. So in, uh, in, in here, we would have actually some residual gauge symmetry, um, which would be, I mean, well, okay, even before you have a residual gauge symmetry, which is that yeah. if, you, if you want Xi to be zero, if you do the gauge transformation by any U, which now depend only on the first two variables T and X, then that will, of course, won't change Xi equals zero because then Xi of this new variable will be zero. So, so you will keep in this. And actually, here we'll have the same thing. If we take something that 
uh, now does not depend on, on, on Z bar, basically, then we would have some kind of residual freedom. And this will, in the end, turns out to just be the standard freedom we have in choosing a lax connection, which is that we know that the lax connection in 2D, we can always gauge transform it, right, again. And that will stay a lax connection because it will still satisfy the zero curvature equation. And that will be kind of this residual gauge sitting there. I see. So, so we don't want to fix that as well. We just for the moment that. we for the moment we won't fix that. Actually, we'll see that in examples at some point it's it's easy to fix that, and that kind of gives you less degrees of freedom to deal with to to fix mm -hmm. this thing. But for the moment, we'll actually keep it free. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So then, if there are no other questions, then oh, there was a question by Emmanuel, I think. Uh, yeah, hi, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, is there an interpretation of the gauge group in this case? Or does it, I mean, it seems, I always got the impression that in the lack story, the the group is something completely arbitrary. Does this 4D picture give you any better interpretation of what the gauge group should be or what it means? So here it's uh, a bit like omega, it's actually part of the definition of the, of the defining data of the theories. So I get different theories for different gauge groups. And well, just to kind of give a, a little bit of spoiler, among the integrable field theories we'll get from, these, uh, from this theory, we'll find, for instance, integrable sigma models, like the principal Carl model. And typically, we'll get the principal Carl model based on the Lie group uh, that we chose for the gauge theory. But I don't know if that answers really the question. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, no, I mean nope. that, that was part of, um, I guess, what I was asking. So that's at least some answer. Thanks. I don't think there is a particular interpretation of it. It's just one choice we have to make. And then by taking different choice, we get different integrable field theories in the end. OK, thanks. All right. Thanks for the questions. So then if there are no other questions, let me go on. So as I said, this was, well, the first relation we could see with, uh, with the Lux equation. And now there are some actually other aspects which will be quite important for us. Uh, later, but which are a bit more difficult to, to explain in an overview. But what I would just like to try to do now is just kind of identify these things. And then later in the, uh, in the, in the lectures, we'll, kind of, we'll try to explain them in, in detail and more precise. And actually, one of these things is hidden in what I've written here on the, the board, which is here. I said this is a meromorphic function. And we'll actually for me, if I have some function which is killed by dz bar, I would not say it's a meromorphic function. I would even say it's a holomorphic function. So why, in particular, why would it have holes? And the reason why I said meromorphic is that I kind of cheated a little bit so far, which is that all the things I've said were actually valid only when, with, when omega is non-zero, because I have always actually the omega in front of all this. So all this argument was actually true only if when omega is non-zero. And that's, in the end, what we will see, and that will be part of, of the work we'll have to do at some point, is that the consequence of having this omega in front is that actually this LTX is not holomorphic. It's meromorphic, and it can have poles exactly at these zeros, so which I will call zeta. So they're just some points in, along CP1, so these zeros of omega. And well, just to keep the name, these in the standard theory of Chan Simons, these are called the disordered effects. So they're basically points, there, we call them defects because they're 2D, they're localized in 2D because they're localized in the CP1 part at specific points. And well, we call them disordered effects because they are, they represent some singularities of the gauge. And let me just mention, there is also something called ordered effects, which is a rather different story. And it's also possible to uh, engineer integrable field theories from order defect in 4D chain assignments. And that gives different type of, of integrable field theories. But actually, for these lectures, I will focus only on the disordered defects part. OK, so that was one of the aspects that we'll need to clarify a bit later. And well, what over is actually, well, we said there is a lax connection. But now there is a very important question, which is what is the two-dimensional integrable field theories which have this lax connection. Because OK, here we just kind of, we saw what should be the equation of motion, because we saw in the end what is the lax 
the Lax equation, but we don't know exactly for the moment what is the 2D field theory that this corresponds to, in particular, what are the fundamental fields of this 2D field theory, and what is the action of this 2D field theory. And that is a subtle question, but a very important one in the end, right? Because we want to identify these integral field theories. And well, the only thing that I can tell you for the moment somehow is that this will be related this time not to the zeros of this dysfunction, but with the poles, of the, uh, sorry, sometimes it's omega, I will call it twist function, but it's just terminology. So this is related with the poles, which now we'll call Z, or this omega. And well, the idea is that if omega has a pole somewhere, then this part here kind of explodes in the action. So now we need to do something in this part to get, uh, to get something which is now well-defined, which behaves well. In particular, we would need to, at some point, put some boundary conditions on A. So at these poles, we'll have to take, we'll have to put boundary condition on our gauge field, on on basically sigma cross z, right, along these poles. And okay, boundary condition in general, we could think these are kind of not so important. These are subtleties, but they didn't, do not like contain any very important physical information in some cases, but in this case, they turn out to be extremely crucial. Because in particular, what we'll show is that we will extract the 2D fields of the theory. So what I, I would have called then these phi i t x before on exactly this, uh, these poles, so this sigma cross z, which is then a 2D um, submanifold of, of my M, right? And this will, because of that, I call it the poles defect. And so that actually will be also a big important part of, of what we'll say, is that in the end, everything, the, the, the way we extract the 2D field theory come from these, the, the treatment of these poles and the appropriate boundary and then in some sense, the final step in all this story is that we take the 4D Chen Simons action, we reinsert the expression of A in it, and then we do explicitly the integration. We integrate over the Z part, so the part in CP1. And then by construction, we get a 2D action, which is only along the sigma part then, and this 2D action, the magic is that it will depend only on these 2D fields phi i that we're living on these poles defects. And then by construction, because we get it from the 4D and Simons theory, we are sure that this, the equation of motion of this thing, they are the equation of motion we found before, which are exactly, which take this lax connection form. So we know for sure that this will be integrable. And this is then the action that corresponds to this lax connection. And well, here in the end, what we see is that this then provides systematically, automatically some integrable field theories. And these depend then on basically a certain number of choice, which are, so I can vary the gauge group G that I choose. I can vary the omega that I choose, and I can vary the boundary condition that I choose on my gauge field. So that we'll come back on that. And well, the idea is that these gives in the end different integrable field theories. And so from this construction, by varying all these things, I get a whole zoo of integrable field theories. And well, among the examples that we can get, for instance, we get the principal Carroll model, which we saw in Ben's lecture. We also get the Yombach study formation of this principal Carroll model, which we also saw in Ben's lecture. Also what is called the lambda deformation, and also many new models. And so that is a very kind of systematic way. And well, uh, for these lectures, what I will do actually is I will focus only on one example, which is the principal Carroll model, which is this kind of simplest one. And some of these ideas of extracting the fields and doing the integration of the action from 4D to 2D, I will actually do it only from for the PCM case to be as explicit and as simple as possible, as pedagogical as possible. Okay, to, so to some, to kind of summarize so far what I said, I have these kind of two small 
schematic pictures, which are a simplified version of what are in the notes. And this one shows then the uh, four-dimensional space-time of the view, which is, as we said, part of composed by sigma on one side, which will be our 2D space-time in the end with coordinate T and X, and on which we have the integrable field theory. And then the other part is CP1, which contains the spectral parameter Z. And on this part, there are two important sets of points, which are the poles of omega, where we'll have some boundary conditions, and which is where we will, in, in the end, extract the 2D fields of the theory by some subtle thing. And then there are the zeros of omega, which correspond to uh, then the poles in the end of the Lax connection, and which is then what I call the disordered effects. And to summarize the main step in the, in the approach, and which will kind of allow me to here give the plans of these vectors. So, well, first in, in, uh, two, in sections two and three, uh, which basically correspond to the second half of this lecture, I will just give some reminder about um, differential forms and then re-explain uh, what is the standard three-dimensional John Simons theory. Then we start, we'll start with the 4D John Simons theory, which will be then in, in the next lectures tomorrow which correspond to section four of the nodes, and in particular introduced this gauge field in three components and the meromorphic one form omega as part of the defining data. Then we'll explain in more details the relation to the Lax connection, to the Lax formalism by doing this gauge transformation that eliminate the Z-bar component. In particular, we'll see, we'll explain what I couldn't explain so far, which is that this actually is meromorphic with poles at the zeros theta of the twist function, which are these disordered effects. Then later, we'll also study the poles defect. So what happened at the poles where we have boundary conditions, which correspond to section six. And in particular, I would explain then how from there we can extract the 2D fields of the theory. And that will be in this section seven, which actually will be only for the case of the PCM. So, so far, all this thing will be rather general, but then starting from section seven, we'll explain this thing only on the PCM case. And also what we will do for the PCM case is uh, compute the action, uh, the 4D action by performing the integration of a CP1 part, and in the end get the 2D action over sigma. Okay, so that was kind of the main overview and the main announce of what will follow. So now maybe I can ask if there are questions. And in this case, I will take just the, the few I, minutes. I have yeah. a question. Yes. So in, in some places you, you write this curly Z and in some places you write CP1. So what's, uh, I didn't get the difference. This curly Z here. Yes, yes. So these curly Z, they're the poles of omega inside of CP1. So they're, they're really, there's a finite set of points inside of CP1, which correspond to the poles of this omega here. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, well, now what I will do is in, in the few minutes I have left before the breaks is actually is a very quick part, which is just a few reminders about differential forms, because as we will as we'll see, it will be very good for us to rephrase everything that I've been saying so far in terms of differential forms. This will be quite more compact, but I just wanted to give a, a brief like a reminder of how they work in general. So here I will take a M uh, of dimension N, right? With coordinate X mu going from one to N. And if I consider forms on M, so for instance, one form, what they look like if I take a one form lambda is, well, I expand them in the basis of one form, which are the DX mu's. And in front of them, I have some components lambda mu, depending on the one uh, here, index mu, which are then functions of x. And in particular, what we see is that the one forms, they depend on n components lambda mu. Then we have, for instance, two forms. And for that, what we do is instead of expanding in dx mu, we will expand in, well, what we construct from dx mu by what you call exterior product or wedge, which is dx mu wedge dx nu, which is something which is q-symmetric. So if I exchange nu and mu, I get a minus sign. And then in front of this, because I have now two tensor, two uh, index here, I have a two tensors, 
lambda mu nu, which still depends on x. And because of the property here of this uh, of skew symmetry, this tensor itself is, uh, is skew symmetric with respect to the exchange of mu. And finally, I guess you can remember all this that we'll have integral p forms, which are like components with p indices, which are contracted with. P of these dx's together. And from there, we can uh, define the uh, more generally the, uh, the wedge product, so the exterior product uh, wedge, which basically, if I start with lambda, which is a P form, and I wedge it with, let's say this psi here, which is a Q form, then what I'll get here, it will be a P cube, a P plus Q form. And in particular, it will satisfy some skew symmetry properties. So if I exchange psi and lambda, I can guess the minus sign. And more precisely, I will get minus one to the power pq because I need to exchange p dx's with q dx's, right? So in the end, I get a sign minus one to the power p. Okay. Another important object that we'll use is the so called exterior derivative. Of forms, which is an, op, uh, an operator which we call D. And if it takes a P form, it sends it to something which we call D lambda, and which in this case is a P plus one form. And just to give, well, the simplest example, if I take a, a one form lambda, which is then just lambda mu dx mu, then the corresponding exterior derivative is, well, I simply take d mu lambda nu, and then I contract this with dx mu, dx nu. And in particular, because I contract it with something which is skew-symmetric, I can freely skew-symmetrize over my first index, over my indices mu and nu here. So I can write it also as d mu lambda nu minus d nu lambda mu, and I have a factor one and a half to avoid overcounting with that. And this satisfy a certain number of interesting property. One, for instance, is the Leibniz rule, which is that if I take d, lam d of lambda wedge xi, well, I will have basically the standard idea that I have first the d acting on lambda times xi plus, well, the lambda times now the d acting on xi. And in general, I can have some minus signs because I have differential form, which is that I have a minus one to the power P if lambda was a P form here, yeah? because my D had to go through the lambdas basically to eat the sum. And also D squared in general is equal to zero. It's the standard thing that basically for all lambda, I have D of D lambda equals zero. And well, the final thing that we will use actually in there is that we have, we can use also uh, G valued one forms, so forms which are now valued in, a, in, the, in the matrix, the algebra that we considered. And this would typically, so for instance, for a one form, it would be a mu dx mu, where now these a mu, they belong to the Lie algebra. And then we can also, in this case, we define uh, the wedge product using then the matrix. So we use the same formula as, as for the standard uh, wedge product, but now we use matrix product of the component. And because the matrix product is not commutative, then this thing actually is not skew symmetric or, or, or symmetric anymore, right? And for instance, it's not true that A wedge A is zero because it's not true that it's skew symmetric. Because for instance, A wedge A will be A mu, A nu, dx mu wedge, dx nu by construction. And that, well, by just basically doing the skew symmetrization in mu and nu, what I construct is a mu a nu minus a nu a mu, which is nothing but the commutator of a mu a nu. And now maybe you start to see why this will be useful for us, because in particular, if I consider the two form dA plus a wedge a, right? So remember that if a is a one form, then dA is a two form, and this is also a two form. Then using what we saw before for the, the derivative here, 
expressed in terms of this one half skew symmetrized derivative, then this I can rewrite it as well one half d mu a mu minus d mu a mu. So this is the da part, and then this part it contributes as a commutator times dx mu wedge dx nu. And there you recognize exactly the curvature f mu nu. So this will be an easy way to kind of use curvatures in the, in the field. And that's why typically we use these differential forms. Okay, so that was well the brief reminder I wanted to do on differential forms. And then the next step now will be to look at the free ditch and Simon's theory using this language. And that will be, I think, the next, the, the second half of these lectures. And I think now is maybe a right time to take a break and to take questions if there are some. Seems there's no question. How, how long do we want to take the break? Something like five minutes. I... Okay, so see you in five minutes. And thank you. Yes. Wait, that strange noise. I have some weird echo, I think. Yes, Sylvan. DX mu, which Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to have the convention for two forms in the beginning also with one half, like uh, all the way above. Uh, you mean here defining this with a one half? Yeah, okay, so I guess my, yeah, here it would not be true that my F is F mu nu contracted with dx mu dx mu. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I meant this, F is somehow independent. I mean, now, now basically I will never use F mu nu again. I will just use this F this way. But yeah, it's true that probably here it would be, it would be more clever to add a one half and probably, okay, I don't know if it should be a one P or one P factorial. Yeah. yeah. Something like that, probably a one P factorial. Very, yes. very minor. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks for the for the comments. <laughs> 
Okay. Should we start soon or has it been around five minutes now? I think you can start. Okay, great. Then let's start back with the second half of these lectures. And well, what we'll then study in this part is the standard three-dimensional Chen-Simon sphere. So, okay, I've sketched a little bit some of its property in the introduction, but now I would like to go in more details in this. And let me then start by, well, defining typically the gauge field of the theory and the action. So in this case, we start with a space-time M of dimension three. And as we had before, we'll put some coordinate x mu with mu equal one, two, three. And the gauge field, the way we'll see it now, is we'll see it as a g-valued one form, A, which then I decompose as A mu dx mu. So I see that because it's a one form, naturally it has these three components, which are then A1, A2, A3. So instead of now talking in components of A mu, I will just think of it as being just one, a one form valued in the algebra. And an important object for Friedrich and Chan Simons theory is what we call the Chan Simons free form. which was introduced by Chen and Simons to study some topological and geometrical properties of manifolds, which is defined in terms of A by the following. So I take, sorry, I take A wedge DA. So if A is a one form, DA is a two form. So this thing in total is a free form. And then I also have a two third a wedge A wedge A. And well, all this is now is a matrix. And what I'll do is to get a number, I will take the trace of all this. And now I'll to just explain a little bit what this looks like. If we go back to components, so because this is a free form, in a three-dimensional manifold, all the free forms are proportional to only one thing, which is dx1 wedge dx2 wedge dx3, because every other possibility of permuting the dx, I can bring it back to this form with some signs. And then in front of it, what I have is I have the trace of this term here gives me a, a mu d nu a rho. And then this other term here give me two third of a mu a nu a rho. And well, in front of it, because I have, a, I have a differential form, I need to skew symmetrize everything. So that's why I have like a Levi Cevita tensor, which is completely skew symmetric in mu neuro contracting. Okay. And in terms of this, we define the action of the theory simply as follows. So if we have in general a P form, we know that P form, we can always integrate them over P manifold. Meaning, in particular here, that my free form CSA, I can integrate it over my free manifold M. And concretely, what it means is that I take the integral of a dx1, dx2, dx3 of this. I have some. Okay. Um, and well, in particular, now what you see is that if I write this in terms of components, I recover exactly what I define as the, uh, as the Chen Simons action in the introduction. Now it was just written in components. Now what I see is that using this free form language, it's actually now quite more compact and I get then just the integral of CS. And actually there's something that I forgot in the introduction, which is that in general, we could have a prefactor in front of it, which we call here K over four pi, where K is just a constant and it's a constant that we call the level of the theory. So, okay, it didn't change the, the discussion in the introduction because, of course, having a global prefactor doesn't change the equation of motion or the gauge symmetry. But in general, we put it, it has some importance at the quantum level. 
Okay, so that's then my action. Let me also actually say here, maybe I should have said this from the beginning. Uh, here I will focus mostly on just the classical properties of this free Hitchin Simons theorem. Actually, it's quantum properties are extremely important in the, in the literature, both in physics and mathematics, and it has led to many important discoveries. But for what we'll do in these lectures, actually, the classical uh, theories will be, will be enough. Uh, so if, if you're interested by that, I invite you to, to go see in more details the very extensive literature on the subject of quantization of free and Simons. But for these lectures, I will stay classical all the time. OK. So not what, OK, I see that. OK. okay. So um, now that we have the action, we can go on with the study of this model. In particular, we can now study the equation of motion of the theory. And so for that, well, we'll do the standard thing that we do to get the equation of motion. We'll consider an infinitesimal variation, which I will call delta A of the gauge field. And in the end, we want to find what is the corresponding variation of the action, which should be zero, and that will give us the equation of motion. And well, what we'll start to do is we'll start by computing the variation actually of the free form of the Chen Simons free form, which is inside of this section. And so that, if I recall, what is the Chen Simons free form? This is trace of a wedge dA plus two thirds a wedge a wedge a. And now, well, what I get is I get different type of term depending on how I distribute my delta. So for instance, I have delta A wedge dA. I also have uh, A wedge, well, the delta and I act on this and I put it inside of the derivative, so D of delta A. And then in this case here, I have, well, a lot of terms, but for instance, I can have A wedge A wedge delta A. And then I would also have some terms where the delta A would act, for instance, in the middle or on the first one. But then what I can do is I can use the cyclicity of the trace to always bring back like a permit by delta A and I always bring back my delta A to the end here uh, of the thing. And well, because I have, uh, sorry, because I have forms here, it could happen that maybe I, when I do this, I have some minus signs that happen, but here, because I do a permutation in three, uh, just cyclic permutation in three uh, indices, then in the end I get no minus signs, meaning that all my free terms with the delta a here, the delta a here, the delta a here, they actually contribute all to the same, and that kind of removes the one third that I had here. So in the end I get two a which a which delta. Okay, so now I would like to put all this in kind of the one form where I have just the only some delta a on the right. So well the thing. I can do, for instance, here is this. I can use the symmetry property and put the delta A on the right. And because dA is a two form, when I do this, I actually have no signs coming up. And then I need to treat this term. And the problem of this term is that the derivative is acting on the variation. And that will, will do the standard trick that we always do in field theory. When we have a derivative acting on the variation, well, we create a total derivative then use the Leibniz rule to make the D act on the other side. And so that I need to use the, the Leibniz rule, which tells me that if I act on by D on A wedge D delta A, well, I have DA wedge delta A, and then minus A wedge D delta A. And remember that here, because this is, uh, I use one form C A, A then when I act by D, when it goes through here, it takes a minus sign. So that's the difference with the standard Leibniz rule. So I need to take into account this minus sign in the expression. And in particular, then when I use this, uh, this in the, in the follow to re-express these terms here, then I see that I create these terms here. It will recombine with this one. And in the end, I get that Delta CSA. Then, well, I get two times this term dA wedge delta A, one coming from there, one coming from there. Then I have actually a total derivative term, which is coming from here. Right? Minus trace of dA wedge delta A. And then still I have this term here, trace of two 
a wedge a wedge delta a. And now, well, these two terms, the first one and the third one, we can recombine them. And actually what we see they form is they reform exactly what we call the curvature before, which is this dA plus a wedge a, right? So in conclusion, what I get is that delta of CSA is equal to two times trace of F of A wedge delta A minus a total derivative, which is the trace of A wedge delta A. And this actually will be useful for us so that we maybe kind of box it. And we, because we'll also use it later, for instance, also in three digit, in four digit assignments. So, um, right. Okay. So now that we derived the variation of the Chen Simons free form, we can look at the variation of the action because that was actually the initial point of this. And well, so to get the variation of the action now, I look at, well, the integral of the variation of CSA. And well, I see there is these two terms and this term here is a total derivative. So what I know is that when I integrate a total derivative, I get a boundary term. So this actually will contribute to a boundary term. on then the frontier, so the boundary dm of m. And so whether m has a boundary or not, that depends on our choice. But for instance, if m is a, is a ball, we can have a sphere as a boundary, or we could also have the case where we take m as simply r free, in which case what we would mean by the boundary is just infinity, the, the, the spatial infinity. And well, the standard thing to do in this case to get rid of this boundary term is we would put some boundary condition on our gauge field A along then this boundary DM. So typically we would ask that something like a certain component of A along DM would vanish or things like that. That would ensure us that on this front, this boundary term actually with this choice of boundary condition vanishes and I can get rid of it. This is the standard thing we, we would do in field theory. Right? And now we're left with only one term, which is, well, okay. I, in front of this, of course, I have always my prefactor k over four pi. So if I keep track of this prefactor, although here it's not so important, and I have k over two pi times the integral of trace f of a wedge delta a. Now the important part is that this thing should of course be zero for all delta a, right? Because this is my action principle. It should be, it should be minimal. So I want this thing to be zero for all delta a. And well, here, because I have a simple Lie group, a simple Lie algebra, then I know that if trace of something times x equals zero for all x, it means that the something itself should be zero. So from there, I get my equation of motion, which is simply that, which is simply what we said in the introduction, which is that f of a is equal to zero, right? And so it's just that now we, we extracted it from in, in, in differential language form instead of extracting it from uh, in terms of components. But we find then that the curvature is zero. And well, just to say as an exercise, so I think it's exercise one in the notes, I leave it as an exercise to rederive it in components this time. So you start with the expression of the action in components and you just rederive, you just do a variation. You do integration by part each time you have a d mu somewhere acting on the delta A and you get rid of the boundary, and then in the end, what you, you, you will recover this thing. Or you could even, if you want, compute directly the euler lagrange equation, and you would directly find that this equation of motion take this form in components. OK. So now that we have the equation of motion, well, one question we could ask is, can we even find solutions of this equation of motion? And for that, we'll look at specific Thing. So we'll look at function G that goes from M to the group G. So such that I recall that the Lie algebra of G is the choice of my Lie algebra initial. And well, in this case, we can consider 
the quantity called the Morakartan one form, which we also saw, for instance, in, in Ben's lecture. So G inverse DG, which is then valued in, in the Lie algebra, typically. This thing. And then there is what we call the Morakartan identity, which tells us that D of G inverse DG, it obeys the following expression, the following identity, G inverse DZ wedge, G inverse DG equals zero. Actually, this we also saw in Ben's lecture. And well, I just also leave it as an exercise to read or write it, either in components or in, in differential forms. It's just a direct computation. It's also a standard uh, <clears throat> identity coming from, from uh, non abelian gauge theories, for instance. And the consequence of that is that it's now simple to see that if I take A equal G inverse DG, this is a solution of the 3D Chen Simons equation of motion, right? Because this exactly tells us that the curvature of G inverse DG is zero. So this gives me a general class of solution, which take this form. And actually one can wonder, is it, are all the solutions of this form? And well, this is a bit subtle, this is actually in general only true locally. So locally, all solutions, are of this form. And well, globally, it depends on M. It depends on the topology of M. So if M is nice enough, like typically simply connected, then this would be true. But actually, if you start having weird topologies, then you can have more exotic things happen. OK, so that was the discussion of the equation of motion, where in particular, we recovered this zero curvature thing that the action gives a zero curvature. And now well, the other thing I would like to discuss is the gauge symmetry of this 3D and Simon's theory that we also kind of mentioned in the introduction. And so for that, I will consider then the gauge transformation by some functions u that are functions on the manifold m valued in the group. And that then sends my a to what I will define as a u here, which is u a u inverse minus du u inverse. Or if I write it in components, what I have is a u mu equal u a mu U inverse minus d mu u. U inverse. And this, well, you recognize like this is as in, in young males uh, theories, right? So in any non abelian gauge theory, this is typically how the gauge field will act. And just as a remark, uh, other gauge transformation will act, just as a remark, if g is abelian. And if we write u typically as exponential of lambda or minus lambda, what we find, so because u is abelian, actually the, the conjugation gives nothing. So I find that a mu u is, this part just gives a mu again. And then this derivative term, I derivate just an exponential. So I get plus d mu lambda. And this is typically what you would get, for instance, in Maxwell, right? So it's the gauge transformation like in, like in abelian gauge theory. But here we'll focus on non abelian cases. OK, and so, well, here what we would like to say is that this is, in some sense, a gauge symmetry of this theory. And, well, actually, what we'll see is it's a bit subtle in which sense it's a gauge symmetry. But the first thing you can look at is the equation of motion. And for that, we'll use the result that if I take the curvature of a connection and I take the gauge transformation of A by U, then it's a rather standard result from, uh, from gauge theory that this transform the curvature just, we say it's covariant, it transforms it just by conjugation, right? So this, I, I won't reprove it, but it's a rather standard formula. Once again, I leave it as an exercise to reprove it in forms. I think it's exercise three. 
And in particular, this is what we use, for instance, in Young Mills theory to construct the Lagrangian because we take the trace of F squared. And because we take the trace and it, com it is constructed by, I mean, it transformed by conjugation, then this forms a Lagrangian, which is gauge invariant. But in particular, what we see, the conclusion that we get from there is that the equation of motion of the theory, which were FA equals zero, they are clearly gauge invariant. And so if I, if I have a solution, F a equals zero, then of course, a mu, a u, which will also be a solution. And just as a little remark here, so the solutions which I had in the previous case, these G inverse DG solutions, they're just gauge equivalent To, well, if I do the gauge transformation by G, you can convince yourself that the effect of that is exactly to cancel completely this thing. So these are gauge equivalent to a gauge field, which is completely zero, actually. And this is why we call sometimes these, this type of solution, we call them pure gauge solutions, because basically they're the, the vanishing gauge field up to just a gauge transformation. Okay, so what we saw is that then the equation of motion are, are indeed, uh, so the, this transformation, they're indeed the symmetry of the gauge of the equation of motion. But one can wonder, is the action invariant? And that actually, well, of course, if the action is invariant, then the equation of motion are invariant, but the converse is not always true. And to study the, uh, the, the transformation of the action under the gauge symmetry, what we should look at first is how the Chan Simons forms, preform, transform. And that is, well, it's a little exercise to do. And what we find is after a few computations, we find the Chan Simons form of A plus a total derivative term, which is derivative of trace of U inverse DU wedge A. And then there's a term which is one third trace of u inverse du cube. And okay, this will also be useful for us later. So let me again kind of box it. And well, it's a rather direct exercise to check. Actually, it's once again an exercise in the vector notes, which I think was exercise four. And you can do it by brute force using differential forms or once again in complex. And if we look at the consequence of this on the action, well, we have, we can look at the different terms that we get. So the first term, it gives us just exactly the action of A again. Then this term here, it's a total derivative. So this will give us a boundary term. And well, typically what will, Recall that on A, we have some boundary conditions that we put on the, on the boundary DM. And what we should do then when we do gauge transformation, we should restrict to the gauge transformation that are compatible with this boundary condition. So actually there are also boundary conditions on U. And by taking these boundary conditions on U and on A, actually one see that these terms on DM, this boundary term actually does not contribute once I integrate it over M. So this term actually did not contribute. And I'm just left in the end with this term, which with the prefactor gives me k over 12 pi integral over m of then trace u inverse du cube. Now, here what I say with this uh, wedge cube, it means that I take this form and I wedge it with itself free time, right? So this is a free form integral. And this thing actually, you might recognize it from Ben's talk, which is that this is what in Ben's talk resemble really what was called the vest zumino term. And well, Ben's the, in his lecture described a little bit the properties of this vest zumino term. In particular, if I consider the corresponding free form, right? This, so one over 12 pi trace of U inverse du cubed. Then this has some nice property. In particular, it's closed 
meaning that the lambda equals zero, but it's not exact. Meaning that, so lambda, so being exact would mean that lambda would be the derivative of something. It would be some d alpha, but now well, what I say, it's not exact. So it's not the derivative of something. Actually. Meaning that it's not a boundary term, right? I can't just say that it's a boundary. So in the end, what we find is that the action is not strictly speaking invariant. In the end, S of AU is different than S of A. Because there is this additional term, but actually the fact that it's closed, the fact that the additional term that we add is closed actually has for effect that the equation of motion stays the same. And well, that is of course consistent with what you observed because we checked explicitly that the equation of motion were gauge invariant. And this is just because although the action are not the same, in the end, the, uh, the equation of motion that they derive from there is the same. And also another here remark is that if I consider the quantum level and I consider what appears in the action in the path integral formulation, the exponential ISA, which is in the path integral, then actually there are some nice property of the Benzumino term, which I won't really go into the details here because for us it's not so important, but I just mentioned it for kind of the folklore. If we take the group to be compact, and if we have some nice manifold M with a nice topology or a nice boundary condition and things like that, we can typically see that this Benzumino term will be actually proportional to two pi times an integer. And well, the effect is then that if I have two pi times an integer shift, then actually in terms of the exponential of ISA, then this is actually a gauge invariant. And for that, I need K to be an integer. So what we see is that at the quantum level for the path integral to be gauge invariant quantity, I need K to be an integer. So I get a, a quantization of the level. And in this case, my theory really defines uh, my path integral really defines a gauge in one object. Okay, so that was part of the main thing I wanted to say about these, uh, this standard 3D and Simon's theory. And let me then just end this part with a few general comments on it. So as I said, the literature on Chen Simon is very rich, and well, here I won't, I can't go into all the details, but just although some of these will not be completely necessary for us later, I just wanted to say a few words about some of the important properties of this theory. Now I see that there is something in the discussion. Okay, yeah. So one property is that so far to define this theory, I used only differential form. And one of the interests of differential form is that these are, this is something that Weber used uh, the choice of, a, of coordinates actually when I use differential form, which means that concretely I could make a change of coordinate and I would get the exact same theory without changing the way I express it. And concretely what this means is that the theory has diffeomorphism invariants, which is a nice property for a field theory, and actually, we know other theories which have diffeomorphism invariants, such as general relativity, for instance, or, or string theory in the word sheet. But these are typically diffeomorphism invariants because we have put some uh, dynamical metric on our spacetime M, right? And by allowing the metric to also vary in the diffeomorphism, we get in the end a fully uh, diffeomorphism invariant theory, like typically in general relativity. But here, we never had to put a metric without uh, on M. So this, well, this different system invariants was obtained without uh, a dynamical, dynamical metric on M. Okay, sorry, my writing becomes a bit terrible at the end. And that is an important property which makes the Chen Simon's theory what is called a topological field theories. And well, okay, as I said, I won't go into the details of this, but the idea is that because of this, in the end, 
the uh, the theory depends only on m and it won't depend even on the really the geometry on m it will depend more on the property of m as a manifold and so typically the theory will measure topological property of m and typical example of that are what are called knots invariants and that was actually part one of the main motivation for the introduction of this 3D John Simons theory. And in his seminal paper uh, by, by Witten, he indeed showed that we can get a lot of knots invariants, such as, for instance, what I call Jones polynomial, by studying the uh, quantum gauge invariant observables of this 3D John Simons theory, which in the end indeed depends just on kind of the underlying topology of the property of the, of the manifold. Another observation is that locally all solutions are a equal g inverse dg we said so locally all solution are thus gauge equivalent to a equals zero, right? By doing a gauge transformation, I can always eliminate completely this solution. It means that on any neighborhood, actually all my solutions turns out to be in some sense equivalent to the trivial solution. And that can seem a bit surprising. And what it tells us actually is that in this theory, there's no bulk degrees of freedom. No, well, local, let's say more local bulk degrees of freedom. So they, basically, there's no propagating degrees of freedom. And that is actually quite different from the standard gauge theory we would have. So for instance, we could do, do, do Maxwell, then actually solving the equation, the equation of motion up to gauge, we would find in the end two polarization that would kind of propagate, that would be the actual degrees of freedom of the theory. But what we find is that for for these three digits assignments, there's actually no propagating degrees of freedom. There's no local bulk degrees of freedom. And one could then wonder, does it mean that the theory is actually completely trivial? And the answer is no, because in general, there could be, well, two things. There could be, first of all, global degrees of freedom. And these are typically related to the topological properties that I mentioned before. So for instance, you can consider what I call Wilson loops, which are not local degrees of freedom, but extended objects. And in the end, these are typically what will serve for constructing this topological environment. And the other kind of degrees of freedom that are non-trivial are the boundary degrees of freedom. And well, the idea here is that typically we had a boundary DM and we had to impose some boundary condition on A and this boundary. And because of that, we need to restrict the, bond, the, the gauge transformation to the one that preserves this boundary condition. So on, on, my, on my boundary DM, actually my gauge transformation, they're not as general as I would like them to be. Meaning that in particular, I cannot use them to gauge away all the degrees of freedom. This is a bit schematic, but it's a bit the idea. And in the end, that makes as a consequence that in general on DM, we could have remaining boundary, boundary degrees of freedom that cannot be eliminated and which are actually physical. And this was also observed in the uh, seminal paper of, of, uh, of Witten, where actually showed that what you get on DM is a Vesumino Witten model. So, which is also a model we saw in Ben's lectures, right? Which is the completely conformal uh, Sigma model. And then what, uh, what was shown is that the 3D Chen Simons theory in the end on the, on the, the, the boundary, you get some remaining degrees of freedom, which obey some kind of Carroll that's zooming a bit here. And this is actually a bit reminiscent of what will happen in our case of 4D chain assignment. When 4D chain assignment, we will have boundary conditions at the poles defect, so these poles of omega. And because of that, there are some degrees of freedom that we won't be able to gauge away and actually we will be able to eliminate by gauge all the degrees of freedom in the bulk, so all the 4D degrees of freedom, the local 4D ones. But in the end, we'll remain with some 2D degrees of freedom, which are the ones which are really at these poles. And this is because of this kind of similar mechanism. OK, so that's basically, I think, the most 
of the thing I wanted to say. Well, the other final remark was again that this uh, we see that we have zero curvature equation, which is similar to to the chance I, to the, uh, the the integrability as we mentioned in introduction. And what well, well, so next time is how now we'll go to four digit assignments to incorporate the spectral parameter in it. Last thing that I could maybe mention is that the um, in, in addition to this thing of zero curvature equation, another thing of integrability that appears in the three digit assignments is actually the uh, the Young Baxter equation. It appears in well in relation to these knots invariant in what is called the Rider Meister move. And more precisely, what we get is we would get the Rider Meister move. We would get the Young Baxter equation without spectral parameter once again. And here also going to the four digit assignments theory, we would uh, recover the Young Baxter equation now with spectral parameter. And interestingly, varying, uh, varying the, the space CP1 of the spectral parameter. So here I focused on CP1, but we could consider other cases. And from this, we could actually recover completely the classification of R matrices solving the Young Baxter equation as being rational. So that would be on CP1. Then we could have also all the cases like uh, trigonometric and elliptic. And we recover actually the classification of Belavin and Bridgefield that we've heard in, in Anna's lectures. But okay, here I won't focus really on Young Baxter because what I wanted to focus on is, is integrable field theories, but that was just to, to mention this as a last comment. And then I think I'll stop here for today. Very well, thanks a lot, yes. Sylvan. So let's have a round of applause for him. So thank you, Sylvain, for this very nice first lecture. Um, now we have our coffee break. We are back.